Hi, welcome back to Quantum Field Theory of Students Perspective. I'd like to continue with uh, Lesson 3.5 on um, Symmetry, Gauge Invariance, and Yang-Mills. Today we're going to do, um, going to continue uh, the previous lesson on Know This Theorem. We're going to go to a uh, complex scalar fields. Um, with U1, same thing as SO2, I'll explain in a minute, gauge invariance. Now, previously we had done um, Know This Theorem in the previous video. And um, we applied it mainly to um, space-time transformations. But um, it also applies to um, internal transformation. Non space time what are called internal transformations. Now we see these mostly in like particle physics with things like isospin in the 30s, um, the symmetry between proton, neutron for uh, nuclear forces. And uh, then we extended them to like um, eightfold way Murray Gelman with uh, quarks. Today we would call this a flavor symmetry. And then we also had, um, finally, we got the uh, correct QCD theory of strong interactions. And here we have a color gauge symmetry. So, with Yang-Mills, we we have um, we have, a, we have a group, and this leads to a gauge symmetry. And this is um, extremely important. For the standard model. Now. In this. Um, in this. Series of lectures. As I mentioned. I just want to touch on on uh, the classical aspects of these uh, gauge transformations. Put quotes around gauge. Now, the first thing I want to do is um, explain gauge. Gauge is a term that uh, Weil came up with.
in the context of um, trying to uh, extend or modify general relativity. See, the word gauge originally is, is railroad gauge. And those of you who remember your um, history from World War I, many of the countries, and I think even today, many of the countries like Russia have different gauges than Germany, meaning that their, their railroad cars can't... Um, travel on, you know, they have to be transferred when they hit a border. And the reason was this was thought to make invasion less likely. In, in World War II, uh, railroads were everything. You know, nowadays we have other ways, but back then railroads were everything. And so it was thought having different sizes of railroad tax or gauges would, um, would uh, be a defensive uh, move. So Wilde came up with the idea of maybe the ruler, you know, maybe the ruler or gauge of space, I'll put space time, changes from point to point. Now, when quantum mechanics came out, it was realized that this was the wrong idea. Um, that the uh, the right idea was to um, change the phase of the wave function at different points. So as my high energy uh, physics professor at Caltech, I think his name was David Hitlin, he said that uh, the proper term should be uh, phase invariance. But uh, due to historical reasons, okay, we are, um, we are stuck with uh, gauge invariance. Okay, now um, so these uh, internal symmetries of nature are called gauge symmetries and they've become um, really prevalent. Now the main reference for what I'm going to do today is an old book by Ryder on quantum field theory, uh, second edition. Uh, section 3.3, uh, pages 90 to 97. And, um, you know, I will follow this closely. So um, to start, um, let's say we have uh, we have two scalar fields, uh, with the same mass. So we have, um, let's call it L1 is equal to one half I don't know why I 
that's doing that to me. One half the partial of mu phi, partially mu phi, minus one half m squared. Okay, I want phi one, phi one squared, and then L2 is the same thing except it's on the second field. So you basically have two non-interacting uh, scalar fields with the same mass. And so the total of Lagrangian is just equal to Now, if you stare at this expression, especially the potential, you sort of see that um, this is sort of like an invariant. This could be written, we could do something like phi is equal to uh, ex phi1, put a vector on there, plus ey phi2, and then phi dot phi would be equal to phi1 squared plus phi2 squared. And we know that the dot product of two vectors is invariant. So if we look at a vector in two dimensions, we, we sort of get this. Remember, we're not talking about space-time dimensions. We're talking about dimensions of phi, internal dimensions. And you can see that this part is also similar symmetry, similar rotation symmetry. So under a, an SO2 rotation, and we'll call it in uh, isospace, which would be like the phi1 comma phi2 space, just to make sure you, you don't confuse this with space-time. In isospace, we have a two-component object, and, we, and our Lagrangian is, is rotationally invariant, so if we make these transfer, transformations, I'm using lambda for the angle parameter instead of theta, just to emphasize that it's not space-time. If we make this transformation, we can see that, you know, it's going to be invariant. Another way to do this is we can write phi equal phi 1 plus the fine complex fields. I'm using the star instead of the, the gamma most because I want to emphasize that I'm working classically all the time now. And if we do this complex transformation, we obtain L is equal to And looking at this, we notice uh, a U1 symmetry. U1 is the unitary group of complex numbers, so it's just complex numbers. It's one dimension, so we don't have to have matrices of magnitude 1. You know, the absolute value of, uh, of uh, whatever we call it, let's say the group element is equal to 1. 
Now, um, so here the symmetry, instead of writing it like we wrote it above, you can see that it's exactly the same as if we write it this way. Now, it seems crazy to treat um, phi and phi star as uh, independent variables. Mathematically, it doesn't seem right. They're not independent variables. But um, as many books as Coleman... page 111 of his lectures. And uh, Z in his book. Show it actually works. What you're doing is you're taking linear combinations, and since phi1 and phi2 are independent, you can treat phi and phi star as independent also. Um, Sernecki also uh, mentions this. In problem 3.5, page 30 of his uh, textbook. Okay. And from the Lagrangian, we obtain the usual equations of motion, which we won't really use much. Now... So just to, um, you know, if I were to draw the symmetry in a plane, the first way I did it with the rotation, I would have like a EX is this way, EY is this way, and we would have like a vector phi, and then it would go to a new vector. This would be like an angle lambda, so this would be the transformation. And uh, the alternative is just to look at uh, the unitary circle in a plane. This is like in the complex Z plane. And this is a uh, absolute value of Z. So this is just a unit circle, and here we would have something like the phase would be e to the i lambda, and then it would go to here, e to the i. Say we would call this lambda prime. I could call this phi and phi prime. So phi is essentially going from e to the i lambda to e to the i lambda prime. Okay. Um, so mostly we'll work in the U1 and, and this group is isomorphic to SO2. The reason why I showed the SO2 is um, in the next lecture video I'm probably going to go to SO3 the rotation group in three dimensions and so it's sort of similar to the way SO2 is but now it's going to be three dimensions. Um, so these are called, um, at least Ryder calls them, gauge transformations
of the first kind. And uh, for the infinitesimal version, we'll have del phi is equal to minus i lambda phi. Del phi star is equal to i lambda phi star. And this implies that del the partial of mu phi is equal to minus i lambda the partial of mu phi and del partial mu phi star is equal to i lambda partial mu phi star. So if we remember our last lectures, know this theorem. Gives a current copying this from the last lecture here we're using lambda as the parameter and um, also f mu equals zero here since um, the Lagrangian itself is invariant. So, and the field phi A, the index, instead of like phi 1, phi 2, we're going to use phi comma phi star. So, uh, so J mu works out to partial of L with respect to the partial mu phi times del phi del lambda plus the partial of L with respect to the partial of oops. And this is equal to um, just using the definitions above, we get our usual current. Um, Many of you will recognize this current. I'll put a box around this equation. This is the J mu of a two scalar fields. Um, and from the equations of motion, it follows that the partial of mu J mu equals zero. And also that Q, it's equal to I, the integral, phi star, the partial of phi with respect to T, minus phi, the partial of phi star with respect to T, dV equals zero, and dQ, dT equals zero. Okay, also note If uh, phi equals phi star, that, that implies Q equals zero. Okay. Now, one of the great um, ideas of um, physics is, um, is, is to let the, um, the parameter lambda be uh, space-time dependent. Just to um, 
remember when I took a course from um, John Preskill of uh, Caltech on um, QCD back when he was a particle physicist before he became a, a quantum a, a quantum information theorist he, he said that um, hope I can remember them stated that there are three great ideas of particle physics and um, one of them the first one he said was uh, gauge invariance I think the first one he actually said was symmetry and uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking and the third one was uh, renormalization he used to say that's it you just gotta know that those three things and you're okay so um, Getting back to our gauge case, now we do the same thing as before. We uh, infinitesimal case again, phi minus i lambda phi. Then we have del phi equal minus i lambda phi as before. And this defines covariant. for a phi field. So anything which transforms in this manner is said to transform covariantly. Now we have the partial of mu phi goes to the partial of mu phi minus i. Now since lambda is no longer a constant we get extra terms. So we get minus i the partial of u lambda phi minus i lambda the partial of mu phi and because of um, because of the second term okay so I get del partial of mu phi is equal to minus i lambda partial of mu phi that's this term I'm just reordering it minus i partial of mu lambda phi so this term is okay this term is good that's covariant But this term is bad. So del so so the partial of mu phi is not covariant. And similarly, we have del phi star. I want to box these. del phi star is equal to i lambda phi star and this uh, in the same way And the same way as before, we're going to get del partial of mu phi star is equal to i lambda partial of mu phi star 
plus i partial mu lambda v star. And again, this is good, and this is bad. Bad. So I will... Uh, box those equations. Now let's figure out what happens with the Lagrangian. Del L is equal to del partial mu phi to partial mu phi star minus m squared phi star phi. We know that phi star phi goes to e to the i lambda phi star e to the minus i lambda phi which is equal to phi star phi. So this is invariant, whether it's infinitesimal or finite. So we don't have to worry about that term. Now we're going to get del the partial mu phi, partial mu phi star plus the partial mu phi, just using the product rule here. Del partial mu phi star. And this is equal to minus i lambda partial mu phi, using those boxed equations that we had above. Minus i partial mu lambda phi, partial mu phi star, plus partial mu phi, i lambda, partial mu phi star, plus i partial mu lambda phi star. And uh, we're going to get cancellations here. Uh, this term this term minus i lambda the partial of mu phi partial of mu phi star cancels um, partial of mu phi star i lambda partial of mu phi. So that cancels that. And so I just get the partial of mu lambda times minus i phi partial mu phi star plus i phi star partial mu phi. And this is equal to the partial of mu lambda j mu. Let me define the uh, current before. Now, so, um, so by, um, by making, uh, lambda space time dependent, you know, we have lost, uh, gauge invariance. And now to restore it, we need to uh, add some terms. To the Lagrangian. Okay. So a lot of the. What I'm going to do right now. A lot of it seems like it uh, comes out of nowhere. And in a sense, it's, we're sort of working backwards, um, you know, but a lot of this is, um, comes from classical physics as well. So what we're doing here is we're sort of doing something that's not that difficult because we have a simple group, U1 or SO2, which is an abelian group. So we don't get the really complex stuff when we do the Yang Mills, but it helps us prepare. So let's define a vector field, A mu, which we all recognize from electromagnetism. 
such that under a gauge transformation, a mu goes to a mu plus 1 over e partial mu lambda. e will end up being, this is not the e of mathematics, this will be e will be like a charge. Q might be a better symbol for it, but e is fairly traditional. So, and we'll add a term, and simultaneously with that, we will uh, add L1 is equal to minus E J mu A mu to, uh, to L. So we now get um, L1 is equal to minus E We're going to use the uh, definition that we had earlier of the current, so I'll just have minus E phi star the partial mu phi minus phi the partial mu phi star A mu. Now we'll, let's calculate what del L1 is. So this is equal to minus E del J mu A mu. That's what we had before. Then I have minus J mu. And from this, del A mu is just um, sorry. So I have um, del A mu is 1 over E, the partial of mu with respect to lambda, the E's cancel out. So I just get minus J mu, the partial mu lambda. Now, this is good because here we had this term here. And notice it's the same partial mu lambda J mu partial mu lambda J mu. It's the same as this with opposite sign. So we, we're able, we cancel out this piece here. I'll go back to here. We cancel out that. And so now, so now we need to, uh, now we need to uh, cancel the first term. Now, like I said, for an abelian gauge theory, this isn't um, too hard to work out. When we do the non-abelian calculations, it'll be a lot harder. So let's figure out what del J mu is because it occurs over there. This is equal to I. Remember the the current is always always has an I in it. Let me go back up to my definition of current. Positive I. Okay. So this is equal to I del phi star the partial mu phi minus phi partial mu phi star. So this is equal to I now we have um, del phi star, which we know is I lambda phi star partial mu phi plus phi star times del the partial of mu phi. And if you go back and look in one of our box things before, you'll get this. Okay, 
and then going to the second term we'll have minus del phi which is minus i lambda phi partial of mu phi star minus phi now we have del the partial mu phi star which is i lambda partial mu phi star plus i partial mu lambda phi star now there are a bunch of cancellations here um, this term over here i lambda phi star the partial mu phi cancels with this term over here and this term becomes plus i lambda phi the partial mu phi star which cancels with uh, this term here so we end up with um, then the i and the minus i's make one so we end up with um, remember there's this minus sign here um, We end up with 2 phi star phi partial mu lambda. Oops. So this is what del j mu is. Box there. So the total of del, the original Lagrangian, I should have written L0. I'm going to write it now, but I didn't before. Plus del L1 is equal to minus 2. Remember, we multiplied this by minus A mu over here. So this is equal to minus 2E phi star phi the partial of mu lambda A mu. So we need to cancel this. But this is easy to cancel. And uh, I'll just show you the solution. If we look at L2 as being uh, E squared A mu A mu phi star phi. Um, by the way, if you ever study scalar electrodynamics, you know, we're also used to Feynman diagrams where we have diagrams like this, right? Photon, say E minus and E minus, but this is for spinner. Spinner electrodynamics, the Dirac equation. Here we're doing scalar electrodynamics, and what we have is a, a, a meson, and it interacts at a point. This is a gamma, and this is a gamma. So you can see we have two a mu's, a mu, a mu, and phi star phi. I can think of like phi star here, and phi here, and uh, these are like a mu, a mu. So um, I was always confused about this because I studied from Broken and Drell, which always did spinner electrodynamics first and didn't do scalar electrodynamics until much later. I foolishly always thought we need, needed three particles at a vertex when it all comes from the Lagrangian. If we have four fields at a vertex, we're going to get four particles at a vertex. Anyway, that's just an aside. So this is L2. Now what's del L2? What happened here? Ah, I just don't understand. What happened? It drives me nuts. I do nothing and... Uh, Okay, 
Sorry about that. So we have um, del L2 is equal to 2 e squared a mu del a mu phi star phi. Remember, phi star phi is always invariant. This is equal to um, 2 e squared a mu 1 over e, the partial of mu lambda, phi star phi. This is equal to 2 e a mu, partial mu lambda, phi star phi. So this exactly, these two terms exactly cancel now. So the, uh, the total Lagrangian, I'll write it out in a little while, L0 plus L1 plus L2 is now invariant under, is now gauge invariant. Um, we've introduced the field A mu, it couples to the current of the uh, complex phi field, but um, a mu is presumably dynamical, so we should add a term involving A mu by itself. So a mass term would be something something like uh, M squared A mu A mu. This is how we would introduce a mass term. But this is not, this would be like for a massive photon. Okay, but, but it is not gauge invariant. You can, you can substitute and you can see that it's not going to be gauge invariant. So this is one, one way of um, thinking why the uh, the photon is massless. Okay, but we can define, and we should, a gauge invariant field term F mu nu equals and um, it's easy to check basically it's just anti uh, symmetry It's easy to check that um, F U mu is unchanged. So, so we can add and I won't explain the minus one quarter. This is just uh, normalization and other things. So we can add a term, and it ends up giving the positive energy density that we want. To uh, to the Lagrangian. So this will be. This is basically the, um, you know, the e squared minus b squared term in uh, classical 
EM Lagrangian. So now the total Lagrangian, I'm going to write it out now. This is the uh, kinetic term for the field that we started out with. This is the coupling to the current that we added. This was the mass term that we originally had. And now this is our last final term for the photon. I'll put that in the big box. So this is the Lagrangian for a gauge scalar field coupling to a charged particle. And we can also write this. Shouldn't have put the box in there that quickly. This is very important. So these are what are called um, Covariant derivatives. And I want to show that right now. So we're defining d mu phi is equal to the partial of mu plus I E A mu phi. And I want to show how this term, so let's calculate del D mu phi is equal to del the partial of mu phi plus I E del A mu phi plus I E A mu del phi. So this is equal to minus I lambda partial mu phi minus I E partial mu lambda phi plus I E 1 over E partial mu lambda that's del A mu times phi plus I E A mu minus I lambda phi. Okay, and we get cancellations here. This term cancels. Um, del A mu should have had a 1 over E. So this shouldn't be here. And um, this term cancels the next term. So we end up getting minus I lambda partial mu plus I E E mu phi, which is equal to minus I lambda, sorry. minus I lambda d mu phi. And this is exactly uh, what we want for a covariant transformation. And this works, this works also for uh, d mu phi star. So, um, 
And this rule that uh, the partial of u mu goes to the partial of u plus i e a mu, you've all seen before. It's the same thing in classical physics when you work, write it out in terms of 3 plus 1 of uh, classical EM. So uh, phi describes of charge E and phi star this is sort of the antiparticle of charge minus E. And one final thing, I'm not going to actually do the calculation, but the uh, you should. The Euler-Lagrange equations for uh, A mu These end up leading to um, notice here we have covariant derivatives. It's only this new covariant current which is conserved. And this, uh, we end up getting the uh, partial mu of script J mu equals zero. This follows from uh, anti symmetry. Uh, F union. So um, that's all I have to um, say today. Next time, um, next time we'll head into um, more complicated groups. And, uh, and as a result, we'll get Yang Mills. So I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.